We all have a special guest um, and uh, you're going to find an incredible uh, opportunity today to hear from Her Excellency, the First Lady of Sierra Leone. We'll have that very soon. And to introduce her is a very, very good friend of Global Minnesota. Ambassador Arakana Chiombori Kuao is a, a doctor, medical doctor, author. She is a diplomat. She was the African Union's representative to the United States. She is a lifelong and tireless advocate of connecting our diaspora community in the United States with all of Africa and with the rest of the world. Her African Diaspora Development Institute is one of the leading organizations helping weave a stronger, better world by putting us together. And it's with great appreciation and much, much goodwill, I wanna ask Ambassador Arakana to join me on the screen and for her to do the introduction of our very special guest, Her Excellency, the First Lady of Sierra Leone. Please join me, Ambassador. Thank you so much, my brother, Richie, um, and all the uh, organizers and members of the famous Global Money Sota. I am so grateful to your organization for extending this invitation to my our First Lady of Sierra Leone, to my uh, brother Basil, um, uh, Manisota United, to the entire Sierra Leone community, uh, in, uh, in, uh, not only in uh, Minneapolis, but in all of Minnesota, to the other African diaspora in the state of um, Minnesota, and of course, in all of the United States. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you someone that I'm proud to call my sister. I am older than her. I should be calling her my little sister, but because she is our first lady, I also have to call her our mother. Today, we have the privilege of having to spend some time and listen to our mother share with us what has been done in Sierra Leone since the war. The lessons that could be learned from what Sierra Leoneans have done since the war. Allow me to take a minute and tell you a little bit about my first lady. Her name is Fatima Maada Bayo. She is the first lady of Sierra Leone. Her husband is the president of Sierra Leone, His Excellency Julius Mahada Bayo. They've been in office since 2013 to present. Our first lady was born and raised in Sierra Leone. She left for London, where she's a graduate of Roham Roehampton Institute, London College of Communication. She is an actress, a screenwriter, and a producer. She's a very well famous known actress of the, the London-based Nollywood movies. Our first lady, since coming back home to Sierra Leone, she has been an advocate for women's rights and children's rights. She's very well known, not only in Sierra Leone, but around the continent for her program, which she has titled Hands Off Our Girls, where she is fighting viciously against early child marriages. One thing I can tell you about what is so exceptional and what I love so much about our first lady. She is a first lady who is her own person. She is a first lady who understands that as a first lady, she is the right hand man, the right hand of the president. She's a first lady who is not afraid to call out the president if she feels the president is out of line. She's a first lady who truly is a partner to our president, President Maadabayo. The first lady of, like, of Sierra Leone is one woman. Yes, she may have been born in Sierra Leone, but she's also a woman who understands that she is African first and foremost. She happens to be born in Sierra Leone, but she is an African. And she welcomes not only Africans born on the continent, but Africans, people of African descent around the globe. She is as Pan-African as they come. We are blessed indeed as Africans we are blessed as African women, and we are blessed as children of Africa 
to have a first lady like our very own, Her Excellency, First Lady Fatima Mada Bayo, a true champion for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome my first lady, our first lady, Madam Fatima Mada Bayo. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency. I'm so honored. And uh, when I listen to you, sometimes I, I actually look around to see whether you're actually talking about me or someone else. I'm so honored to, to be here this, well, it's afternoon, my end. I'm honored to be here. Very grateful that um, you've given me this opportunity to have a conversation with Sierra Leoneans in uh, Minnesota. I've never been to Minnesota before, so this is my own rec um, reconnection with Sierra Leonean um, um, over there. This is, a, this is a program, you know, I have been asking, I was asking His Excellency um, just an hour ago, I said, well, I'm, I'm doing this program for Sierra Leoneans in Minnesota, and we're talking about fumble talk and all of that. And uh, he said, well, I know fumble talk are doing stuff in Sierra Leone. I can't give you much details, but I know if I know they exist, that means they've been doing something for me to know that they existed in, in Sierra Leone. I'm very honored. Our country, Sierra Leone, definitely is an example to the world. We have gone through a whole lot when it comes to the rebel war. Sierra Leone rebel war was vicious, was very evil. And um, what happened here, no one wished that for any, not even for your enemy. But then we've, we've transitioned, we've gone through that and now we are enjoying democracy. We live in a country that, um, that believes that the best way forward for all of us is through democracy. The, the war was bad. This is where the introduction of cutting limbs and uh, and uh, opening a woman's womb to just identify what child is in their stomach when they are pregnant. This is the country it happens. But we don't want to be remembered anymore as a country that um, have such a bad, bad history when it comes to war. We want to be seen now as a country that believe in progressiveness. We are working to make sure that image of our country is no more. We have put the past behind us. We are progressively working very viciously to make sure that the world know and understand that we are a different country now. We've had three um, presidential election after the war, which uh, brought in um, His Excellency, the late Amity Jan Kaba, and then His Excellency, and it's by Koroma, and now His Excellency Julius Madabi, who happened to be my husband. So we have transitioned. We have moved away from that cutting of limbs, chopping of people's head, killing of women, raping of women and children. We have transitioned from that to, to a different kind of battle that we are fighting now in Sierra Leone. We don't have guns. We don't have, um, we don't use guns on each other anymore. We don't use um, all of those bad weapons on, on our citizens anymore. But yet still, we do have a, we have a situation that we need to deal with. And that is the issue of rape. And um, um, rape is something that has not gone away yet in Sierra Leone. I don't know whether it has not gone away because now people are talking about it. Before now, we don't get people to talk about rape because they are very much ashamed to really talk about being raped and knowing full well that there will be no consequences. But for now, we've given them the platform to believe in us, to believe that this government is a different government that is ready to fight their war. We have set up um, for the very first time in our history, we now have a new court, a court that sits only for rape cases. And um, we, we have a new um, set of laws. We have policies that have been changed for, to give victims more rights to, I mean, the police, the military, um, different NGOs around the country. Everybody's working. 
with synergy, we're working together to make sure these crimes are, are, are put behind us also. But I mean, with everything I can say about um, Sierra Leone right now is the fact that we have peace and we enjoy our peace. And we are, we are definitely going to a different phase. We have a new president, a president whose own battle is against corruption, a president who believed that he had to stop corruption. And he keeps saying to everybody, for you to, for you to be um, um, the president of Sierra Leone, you should be ready. You should be ready to fight, fight, fight as if every day your life depends on it when it comes to corruption, because the more you fight corruption, corruption fights back. So he is focused on that. He also believes that really for us to be able to, for us to be able to succeed in this country, we have to be educated. He believed the reason why the war took a toll on Sierra Leoneans is the fact that we have a whole lot of illiterate people who could not who could not actually differentiate when um, politicians come to them and lie to them. So he decided that the best thing to do, we have to give free education to everybody. With free education, a girl child will not be deprived anymore because before now, when a child, um, when a woman have three, four different children and they had to pay school fees for their kids, Definitely, they decide they, they will focus on paying school fees for their for their sons instead of their daughters. So, with the new government, we felt no, we cannot allow this because fifty one percent of the population in Sierra Leone are women, and we cannot relegate all our women in the kitchen. So, all women, all boys and girls now have the same right, same privileges to go to school, to be educated in the same classrooms and have the same qualification as their boys so that they can be partner in development too. So that is ongoing the last two years. We are working on that and His Excellency is leading that um, fervently. Like I said, with corruption, corruption is, is the backbone of a whole lot of problems in Africa. And he's fighting, he's fighting corruption, but then the more he fights corruption, the more corruption come and fight back. And we, you know, we will know how successful the fighting of corruption will be until he leaves office, because definitely he's, he's ready to fight corruption as long as he's the president of this country, he's going to fight corruption before his government and in his government. And even when he leaves government, that is what he wants to focus on. So like I said, we, have to, we are a new country. We are not new in terms of independence, but we are new in our mentality. We are new in the way that we think, and we are new in the way that we want to treat our people. We don't want to treat our people just as um, political pawns. We want to treat them as equals. We want our people to understand they are important. For government to be successful, your people have to be successful. For governments to work with, um, in synergy, they have to be working with the people. If the government definitely is not working with the people, then they don't understand the people's problems. So that's the reason why His Excellency and his government, myself, we work for the people. We focus on the people's agenda. We don't make anything of our own agenda. The Hands of Our Girl campaign that I champion, that fought for girls and women in this country, is really not about me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm too old now for me to be worried about who is going to be raping me tomorrow. But then we have a whole lot of kids. We have so many children going through um, a whole lot of bad things in, in, in Sierra Leone. But it's not just a Sierra Leone thing. This is an African thing. This is an African mentality. They rape kids and then what happened? Family cover them up and, you know, it's like they're more worried about talking about it instead of protecting the victim. So the victim is victimized twice. And these are the things that we're fighting against. And that is what I am championing to make sure you cannot victimize a victim twice. When a child is raped, when a woman is raped, we will fight for that child or that woman. We'll fight for them until they get justice. So that is our focus. That is what we are focusing on. I'm so pleased that we have um, John and Sarah who have focused on, on Sierra Leone and focus on our past because like I said, the past of Sierra Leone is the war. That is, in, that is our history. You cannot write your history and leave out the past. That is our history. We've gone past that one now. 
we have done three democratically elect, um, elections and we have been successful as to where we are right now. So I'm hoping that when they go beyond the reconciliation, the reconciliation has happened. And that is one thing that I believe the world should learn from Sierra Leone. Because when you have a vicious war as what we have in Sierra Leone, believe you me, it's, it's hard to forgive. But Sierra Leoneans have managed to forgive one another. They have lived together. They are still living with each other. They see each other and they know exactly what they have done to one another, but they have put that at the back of their, um, I mean, I don't know whether it's called forgiveness, but really they are moving on. Surulinians are moving on. Even the ones that have the, um, their limbs chopped off, the ones that have their legs or the ones that um, someone kill a member of their family or someone kill their wives or their husbands or their children, they, they, they leave to tell the story, but they are not telling the story to go out and revenge. They're not asking for anybody to go and revenge for them. They tell a story, they educate us, and then we see and understand really what is it that they went through. And for, in that way, we are able to, to see how best you can help them. Because the difference with Africa and uh, Europe really is the fact that Africa, America, Europe, with a situation like this, you have counselings, you have people that will listen to your problems and all of that. We don't have that in, in Sierra Leone. We don't have counselling sessions. We don't have people, doctors that really check the mental state of all of these people. So in their own way, they have managed to, to just forgive and move on because they've put the country first and, and, and focus on moving on rather than um, revenge. So um, the tale for John Fumble Talk and, and Sarah, I understand that um, she's put together a movie on, on whatever has happened here. We're looking forward to, for them to come back and, and put together something very pleasant and, and new for our country because it's now the new direction and everything here is changing and it's changing rapidly. So I'm very pleased for you all to invite me here today. And Arikana, I'm, I'm honored that um, you introduced me. When you introduced me, I look for myself again and again if you're really talking about me. But I'm very pleased that um, I'm here and I'll sit in and listen to the conversation. And uh, Thank you. Thank I you do, so much, Your Excellency. It's me more. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's the perfect introduction to uh, John Calker, who is the executive director for the Fambulkum, the campaign. And in this uh, opportunity now, we have for him to give us just a little background on how this reconciliation process was created and where it is now as his role as executive director uh, and also where he sees it going in the near future. John, please join me on the screen and thank you so much um, for your work and for joining us here today. Thank you. Good afternoon from Sierra Leone. Her Excellency, First Lady, I'm so honored with what you've just said, and I believe that's the perfect introduction as Mark has just said. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all. Um, I will focus on I will focus my talk on two things. One, the background, and two, what I believe in, that is local solution to local problems. First, I'll talk about the background. How did, it, how did Family Talk started? I worked as a human rights activist during the war, and I monitored human rights violations. I linked up with um, global human rights campaigns such as Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Article 19, and others, you know, to share the issues that are emerging from Sierra Leone during the war and get them to issue press statements from their comfortable offices outside of Sierra Leone. But we got to a point after the war, you know, when the peace accord was signed between the different warring factions, it was clear that for me, I saw blood on everyone's hands, you know, the rebels, and at that time, the government also, the, they used heavy handedness to fight back, you know, in trying to regain some of their, um, some of the territories. 
So it was more of blood on the hands. And secondly, as a Sierra Leonean, someone who have lived in Sierra Leone throughout, we used to be one family. Your mother is my mother. Your child is my child. You know, it takes a community to raise a child. That is what we know Sierra Leone for. In terms of hospitality, we used to be one of the best in Africa. What went wrong for us to really start to kill each other? You know, what went wrong for us to, you know, put our kids, our parents in the house and set the house ablaze? So my concern was we need to know the root causes. Let's find a way to identify what went wrong so that we can avoid these things moving forward. The Peace Accord made provision for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was mostly, you know, we tried to focus on the South Africa model. And at that time, we sent delegation to South Africa, to Guatemala, to study their own TRC so that we can adjust ours, you know, to fit that approach. However, it did not work well because the TRC in Sierra Leone was more of a truth commission for the big towns. The rural communities were exempted because of logistical co constraints, which we all know. At the time, the world just came to an end and some areas were not accessible. So as someone who monitored the human rights situation, I was really concerned that we cannot just have reconciliation in the big towns without engaging people outside of the, big, outside of the uh, cities because they suffer the brunt of the war. Sorry. So at the end of the day, what we decided to do was to first consult with people in terms of how they want to, how they want to reconcile. Before then, there were several articles saying the people of Sierra Leone don't want to talk about the past, they just want to move on. And I said, well, I know Sierra Leone, we have a storytelling culture where we sit around to, tell the, the, um, to discuss what happened during the day. And I met with Sarah, who was um, a researcher in Sierra Leone. Um, I shared my vision with her and she made the connection with another philanthropist in the US who said, well, let's give it a try. And I said, that's all we need. Because first and foremost, we don't have the answers. We need to consult to the people of Sierra Leone how they want to go about it. And they agreed. So we came back, I came back to Sierra Leone after my fellowship at Columbia University in New York, you know, to organize these consultations across the country, asking people basic questions like, do you want to reconcile? How do you want to go about it? What exists in your communities? How can we accompany you? What else do you need to move this process forward? It was really clear. People of Sierra Leone wanted to discuss what went wrong because we were all baffled. Why did we degenerate so low to killing each other instead of supporting each other? So that's the brief background. And after the consultations, it was clear. People wanted to talk. So we asked them, how do you want to go about it? And they all said, look, we have our tradition, our storytelling tradition over the bonfire. Let's go back to those traditions so that we can be, we can be comfortable in our communities to really tell the story. Why did we go so low? Why did um, the uncle rape the child? You know, during the war, not now, of course, as first lady said, that is unacceptable. But we, 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 we really need to know. And as a result, we were able to design the Fambu Talk approach, which is, it takes like three to six months to work in communities, you know, set up the structures, um, the community welfare and mediation committees, the reconciliation committees, et cetera, so that the people are able to lead their own process. We believe as an organization, we cannot go to tell the people how to go about reconciling. What we need to do is get them to agree. We provide training to the committee members and they in turn lead the process within, the, um, within their sections and chiefdoms on how to go about 
the reconciliation in their communities. And also after going through the bonfire, which is more or less the start of the conversation, we also design follow-up activities, you know, like um, a group of women who come together, like a women support group to address their ongoing issues, you know, like um, their husbands, you know, the challenges of post-war, how can they address that? You know, how can they move on as women, as community? We, all, we also design football for reconciliation. You know, we are, uh, it's, it's a soccer match, no winner, no loser, everyone plays. And, and at the end of the match, they have a disco in the village. It's all a way to bridge the divide between those who have testified in the previous night and the victims so that they can start the journey. We also had programs like um, community farms. And the idea behind that, again, is to bridge the, the gap between the victims and the perpetrators so that they can work in the same farm over a period. And then they agree how to share the proceeds from that um, the, the harvest. So as a result of that, the people were able to not only have the conversation about what went wrong, but they turn around to, to, to become support mechanisms, talking to each other. Oh, you know, we all know what went wrong. We are sorry. How can we support you? You know, initially the concern we had was when people testify in front of the whole section, that's a couple of villages, what will happen next? But everyone becomes their brothers and sisters keeper, providing that um, support, walking through the stream to fetch water, just a tap on their back. Yes, we feel, we, 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 we feel for you and let's move on as a community. So basically, that is how the farm will talk. I would say phase one started. But as, um, the, as Her Excellency said, Saralyn has moved on. Where we are now is what we call farm will talk phase two. That is after the Ebola, we went back. We believe in having the communities at the center of their own processes. So after the Ebola, um, we went around to the communities again. How can we do things differently from the post-war the post-war recovery process? How can we have the people at the center of their own uh, development? How can we have the people at the center to lead the peace building efforts after the Ebola? Because we all knew Ebola was not just a virus, it was also um, it also um, divided communities. Because when someone brought the virus to the community, they see him or her as, you know, as an enemy. But the reality is we are all a family and no one will see Ebola and bring it home. So we, 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 we had to have that conversation at the community level, at the section level, and at the chief level and district. So the people said, what we want is, let's come together and develop our plan. That is where we are presently, the people's planning process. Because we believe Development cannot just be at the big towns. The people know what they want. Let them identify what they want and the government respond to those needs. And I'm happy to say, presently we are collaborating with two main ministries, um, that's the local government and development with oversight from the Office of Vice President, to see how this work that is being piloted in three districts can be cascaded across the whole country. How we can have people communities at the center of their own development, how they can decide on their own, um, on what they want and how they can also contribute to own it and defend it moving forward. So these are just sort of a brief um, background and where we are. Um, I know that we still have a long way to go, but we've had a few um, joint meetings and we, we are still working on um, the design to see how the government can take over the people's planning process through the one family framework so that the government can respond to what the people need and avoid um, giving them what they might not need. I will end with the story. Most times you go to a community with all the good intention. You want to support, uh, you, you see a group of women walking to the stream. You want to support them. You say, oh, these people they are suffering. They are walking two kilometers to go fetch water. Let me get them a borehole at the, at the middle of the town without consulting with them. I can tell you, sometimes it does not work that way, or even most times, because if you don't consult with these people, you don't know why they walk to the stream. 
And what we've, what we've realized is by walking to the stream, sometimes the women, it's like their downtime to talk about the, the day's activities. So like rest a little bit. And if you give them a borehole in the middle of the town, then it becomes work for them 24 hours a day because they'll be doing all sorts of domestic chores, doing all sorts of work, and they don't have time to rest. I'm not saying that is the perfect example, but I just want to end with that story that it's always good to consult with people, ask them what they want, and then support their needs instead of sitting in your comfortable offices as either NGOs or whatever, designing projects for the people. And this is where we are presently. I'm really grateful that um, we have this opportunity to, to share, but I believe local pol local solution to local problems. Thank you very much. I'm gonna step in. I think Mark might have been having um, some connection problems with Zoom. It looks like he's coming back on. Um, John, stay there. I'm Sarah Terry. I'm joining you all from Los Angeles. Um, it was wonderful to hear the First Lady, um, to hear John, you speaking again about um, Fumble Talk and, and Sierra Leone. Um, I'm just, I'm jumping in here because I knew I was gonna talk next. And I, I don't know how many people on this call um, are not Sierra Leonean. I know there's a big community in Minnesota and that many people have joined us but I wanted to say one thing that really struck me. I'm a, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, my background has been in journalism. I've been a storyteller for 40 years. So I love the storytelling um, culture of Sierra Leone. But I first encountered stories of forgiveness when I was in Sierra Leone, um, not long after the war, working for an NGO. And I, I was so startled to hear people talking about being willing to forgive or to have this understanding that people did things that in the war that they would never have done if there hadn't been a war. And, and this was a period of time when uh, there was another war going on in the Middle East, when um, Israel and Lebanon, I believe, were at war again for like the umpteenth cycle. And um, here I was meeting people who wanted to forgive. I, I met the first man um, who, was, who was amputated during the war, a man named Tom Bangauja. And he said, if I take revenge on my perpetrators, their children will take revenge on my children. And then my grandchildren will take revenge on their grandchildren. And that's how generational conflict happens. And we want peace. And here I was encountering this incredible wisdom you know, on the streets of the downtown streets of Freetown, while this war was raging in the Middle East. And, and at that time, I mean, I, you know, believe it or not, this was like early 2000s, you know, the, there was a common term for Africa of like, oh, it's the dark continent. And all I could think was like, really, you want to call this the dark continent? Because this is the place of light. And I want to know more. And I began a project about forgiveness traditions in post-conflict African countries. Sierra Leone was the heart of it. I met John on that trip and heard of his plan. Um, he was pretty discouraged at that time. And I was able to connect him with his, uh, the woman who partnered with him in launching the program, Libby Hoffman. But I think the thing that, um, the reason I made the documentary and, um, uh, First Lady, I, we would love to send you a link to it if you'd like to watch the film. Um, it, the learning space for Americans, and it's why Fumble Talk and, and what we're hearing today, I hope can, can resonate with you um, in, in Minnesota. Um, because what I encountered in Sierra Leone, what I learned was the understanding that that every individual had value to the community, um, that, that to heal, um, people had to be, the community had to be whole for individuals to be healthy. And that's what would drive this process of forgiveness. Um, it was an understanding that it, individuals could have answers that could help communities move forward. And it's an extraordinary difference from a Western mentality that believes in crime and punishment as justice. What I encountered in Sierra Leone 
and in other um, countries in Africa was an understanding that true justice begins with truth telling and then forgiveness um, for what's been done. When you tell the truth, you are forgiven. This is a generalization, but I countered it again and again, most profoundly in Sierra Leone. And then when that has happened, reckon, the work of reconciliation begins. And it's a valuing of um, individuals. I mean, there's a, a saying in Creo in, uh, in Sierra Leone, I'll butcher it, but um, no bad bush for the throwaway, a bad Pekin, which means there's no place to throw away, there's no bad bush to throw away a bad child. Meaning literally we can't discard people. We can't say, oh, so-and-so is you know, just a screw up or they're a troublemaker, you know, let's get rid of them. In, in Sierra Leone, I found always this need to re-knit, to rebuild community because an individual couldn't be healthy if the community wasn't healthy. And that's so different than how we think in the United States, um, you know, with our, our, you know, huge insistence on individualism. And I mean, we're confronting that now, certainly in these times, uh, that whole myth of American exceptionalism and individualism. And I think that's one of the most profound lessons we can learn from Sierra Leone um, and Africa in, is, is, this, is the collectivity of progress and good and the well-being of all. So I know I was constantly humbled by the stories I learned um, when we were making this documentary. It was over an 18 month period. My whole film crew was, the film has been seen in I think 200 film festivals around the world. It's been part of policy making decisions. It's been part of um, NGO discussions, development discussions. Um, the, the Western world in, in many ways has used that film um, to learn more about uh, how to do things right and how to work with um, Africa. How to, especially as John emphasizes again and again, to, lend, to let the community lead uh, reconciliation, lead policy making decisions. Uh, John, I was just really touched. I hadn't heard you tell that story before, but about why some women might want to walk, you know, two kilometers to the water hole so they get a little break and they have time to talk to each other. Who would ever know that if you didn't ask them, right? You would come in as an NGO, you know, thinking you've got the answers or maybe even a government office thinking we're going to make progress here. When those women could tell you, no, I need to walk that day. I need to be with other women. I need time to, to, to like recharge. That's a really, it's a small example, but a profound lesson of what it takes, you know, to ask the community what they need. And again, Mark, I, and so many people here, I know you're experiencing so many of these issues right now in Minnesota and how you rebuild and restore community. And um, I, I just am always, uh, there's so many profound lessons to learn from from Fumble Talk, from Sierra Leone, and um, from Africa. And I see Mark, you're back on the call, so I'll, yeah. I kind of stepped in and started talking. Thank, you. Thank you. And and Sarah and John, please join us back on the screen because I mean you're you're touching on the fundamental thing, which is um, listening and learning and trying to find out. And so we think of that in a global context. You know, our mission is connecting Minnesotans to the world and the world of Minnesota. There's lots of reasons to do that, you know, travel trade and all of that. But fundamentally, we are facing profound uh, struggles, profound dangers, profound obstacles. And we can see and we know because the world is living inside of Minnesota and we watch the news and all of that, that other people have struggles and lessons and successes and have overcome. And so finding this movie and finding this opportunity then to be in direct conversation, maybe it's one of the big pluses from this Zoom moment or this all virtual pandemic moment. But I want to know your thoughts about the continuation of this conversation. John mentioned that they had visited South Africa uh, could, to learn some things, but they could also see things that didn't apply or, or uh, things that needed to be done. John mentioned uh, particularly rural. I mean, Minnesota has this. But I'd like to ask John to unmute himself and Sarah 
um, give us your thoughts about the continuation of the learning from conversation so that our viewers here can see some picture um, into you know where that future goes. You go, John. Bumpas, they will be quiet. Thank you, Mark. You see, the whole idea of the documentary was to further the conversation. You know, Sarah Leon, as a human rights advocate during the war, I was traveling around the world to share, you know, our human rights challenges and to ask for help. But the feedback and the, the, the reaction was Sarah Leon's they drink blood, they do X, Y, Z. But what they never thought was Sarah Leone have the power of forgiveness. And this documentary is just an example to show the world took away most things, but that sense of hospitality, the power of forgiveness was not taken away from us. And that conversation helped. You know, when Sarah produced the, 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 the film, we said, this is like a national bonfire. Mm. And up to date, <laughs> when, they, when, we are, when we are close to elections, you know, sometimes the attentions, our national broadcasters will play the film over and over to remind people that it's really important for us not to forget about the past. But yes, we are moving forward, but, the, but guided by the past. So it's, it's really important to have these conversations move forward. But we should not be stuck with where we are. It's just a conversation to sort of open up, inspire us, and move on as a nation, as communities, as individuals. I thought it was so interesting that during the Ebola crisis, I wasn't in the country then, um, I, I was working on um, another project, but Fumble Talk was able to shift the bonfire program, the reconciliation part of Fumble Talk has, has evolved and shifted into other things. and. Um, during the Ebola crisis, as John pointed out, when it was dividing the communities again, Fumble Talk came right back in with its grassroots community-led, you know, uh, reconciliation. And, it, and Fumble Talk, what I love about it, it's always emphasizing the things that unite Sierra Leoneans. It's building on that beautiful cultural tradition. You know, we know one Fumble, we are one family. That's so strong and again, different than the West. We should learn from it. But I thought it was, what was so interesting was that at that time when, when NGOs were having a hard time operating in Africa, they were treated with suspicion in many uh, cases. Ebola, you know, was so mysterious and threatening and frightening to people that Fumble Talk could activate all of the village-based, you know, community-based processes that it had and make effective inroads in getting people to, to obey health laws and understand, you know, what you needed to do to be safe. And so much so that if I'm not mistaken, John, didn't what, Samantha Power, who was then the um, United States ambassador to the United Nations, she was on a, a trip to Sierra Leone and found out about Fumble Talk from John and, and tweeted about it and held it up as an example of how to work at a community level to, to, to counter such a really huge challenge. So as a journalist, I find that a really interesting um, transfer of practice. You know, to, I mean, and, and again, John, you, I, I mean, I was there when, um, for many of those early community consultations. The desire of people to, to be able to talk about what happened in the war, um, because at that time they'd been told the war is over, don't talk about it. And people had never been able to discuss this heartbreak. They also wanted to forgive. They wanted to have communities restored. I mean, the young men in the film, Saar and Numa, who had been best friends and they'd been torn apart for 17 years. And when they finally could be together again, when one could apologize to the other for some horrific things that he'd done, they were like long lost lovers, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a not romance, but friendship way. They were so happy to be able to say again, you're my friend, you're my brother. And, and I think that that's a, um, that's what Fumble Talk did. And I think as I see it, John, you can correct me, you know, that's what it continues to build on. We are more when we're connected with each other than when we are separated. And that's, 
again, more of an African, my, this is my perception as a Westerner, that's a much more African quality of thought that we can learn from in the United States, especially right now in a country that is so deeply and so tragically, you know, riven in two by, by such misrepresentations. We need here to learn what it means, you know, to say, we know one thambo, we are one family. You know, so that again, I, I just, when, when you all reached out through a mutual friend who knew about Fumble Talk to say what, you know, what could be relevant here for um, Minnesota and all of the world, I, I, there's so many layers. I wish you all could, if you haven't watched the film, watch it. Um, it is set in the past. It is something as the first lady notes, it, it's over. And even the film addresses it as something that's over, but the film is addressing what moves it, what's moving forward, which is reconciliation and peace, which is the foundation for any democratic society. And I feel that here in the United States, we're in the space where we need to figure out how to reconcile and tell, tell the truth and forgive. And to say, you know, you're my brother, you're my mother, you're my sister, which is so natural to Sierra Leoneans. Well, this is the kind of fundamental reason why we're at Global Minnesota focusing on learning from, because these lessons are more than techniques or strategies. These are sort of fundamental. And maybe I'll bring this home to just say that because I was Secretary of State, I was on the board of our Minnesota National Guard. And we trained a couple, a little bit over a thousand Minnesota Guard young men and women to be prepared to go be the back office for the Ebola fight. They trained for over 12 months. And of course, they were very proud to be asked, but also, of course, this is a dangerous mission. Uh, but about a month out, the mission was canceled because the people of the region had turned their resources and stopped the Ebola crisis. Mm. We were ready to go. Our people were all set. And of course, there was happiness when they didn't have to go as well. But now you've given us as Minnesotans another piece of that bigger story. We are connected together in ways that we never knew or thought about, but each of them bring lessons about solidarity and being one family, being one family in a village or a small town, being one family in a big city, being a one family in a continent, being one family on a planet that is going through a lot of things in a more dramatic way right now than we ever have before. Things that are forcing us to be physically separated, but that are forcing us to find those other ways to reconnect and to come back. We need to keep talking about learning more from Sierra Leone and other places. I want to have all of you back for another one of these conversations, but I also want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Ambassador, First Lady, John, Sarah, thank you for sharing your hearts, your soul, your vision, your desired futures. Thank you for helping us to learn, keep connecting us, keep inspiring us, and we hope to keep inspiring and supporting you. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us from all of the planet, 100 and some people it looks like, and this is the beginning or perhaps the second step in a conversation that needs to go on for our lifetime. Our children and their children need us to keep learning from each other. Thank you and goodbye to everybody. <laughs>